I made a video a little while ago comparing 1982's The Thing with its 2011 prequel, The Thing. Specifically, I was looking at practical effects, and I was arguing that John Carpenter's film was far superior because of its practical effects from Rob Bottin. The 2011 film had been shot with practical effects, but they'd been replaced or overlaid with CGI in post-production. If you want to watch that video, the link is in the annoying box on the top right. I was so young back then. But you don't need to watch that video to watch this. Think of this not so much as a sequel, but more of a spin-off to my original vlog. And in this spin-off, I'm going to be looking at what The Thing 2011 might have looked like if they'd have kept the practical effects, and why they removed them. Now I should say that I don't think the effects in the 2011 film are particularly bad or anything like that, I just think they lost a lot of their charm and a lot of their tangibility. Equally, I don't hate the prequel, I think it's okay, but to a name that is synonymous with amazing and innovative practical effects, the effects in the newer film are pretty relevant. One thing I wanted to say is that in the earlier video, I argue that when someone's head splits open in The Thing 2011, that couldn't have been done without at least some digital effects. Well, looking back at the makeup and special effects tests that the special effects studio released, it seems that I might have been wrong. Maybe they'd have had to shoot it differently, but they can obviously do an awful lot. This is from Amalgamated Dynamics. It's a test of the animatronics for the following clip. This is the clip used in the film itself. Now at the premiere of The Thing 2011, Tom Woodruff, one of the co-founders of Amalgamated Dynamics, made a pretty good case for practical effects. I think the real importance of, of having the, the, uh, the presence of practical effects is twofold. It's really a big deal for the actors to have something that's real and very effective and realistic for them to interact with. And also in terms of, of, of audiences, audiences are really savvy today. They're more technically savvy, I think, than, than you give them credit for. And um, they can tell the difference. He also added this. How are you guys working the practical effects with the digital? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I wish it was totally our idea and, and our answer, but it's not. A lot of fans have turned to us saying, I hope you guys don't go digital. And it's not up to us. I mean, the best we can do is, is, is provide a, a huge load of really effective, realistic animatronic and makeup effects, which we did. And there's some great stuff in the movie. And then the digital aspect is really a little bit of tweaking and adding pieces here and taking certain characters in different directions. I don't think it's overdone. Um, you know, I have very specific tastes about practical versus digital, but I think there's a great mix. I like this clip. It's like the director of photography or someone else who wasn't making those kind of decisions standing next to George Lucas at the premiere of The Phantom Menace and saying, I think Jar Jar is a really compelling character. Basically, I think these guys were being diplomatic. They are very established Hollywood. And I think when they gave those interviews, before going into the cinema, they hadn't quite realised the extent to which their work had been undermined. Alec Gillis stood next to Tom Woodruff, and the other co-founder of Amalgamated Dynamics had this to say to coming soon. After The Thing 2011 came and went, we had some postpartum depression. Our design survived mostly intact, but the animatronics themselves were so worked over that we felt we could have done the designs and stayed home. It's not the first time this has happened. Everybody, including Rick Baker and Stan Winston, has had their work enhanced or replaced by CG. Clearly they weren't really happy. Also, a little tangent, those guys were originally attached to I Am Legend when it was going to be directed by Ridley Scott in the late 90s. We started off with uh, miniature maquettes to show body designs, and then we moved on to uh, full-scale busts to develop the uh, kind of gaunt look of the characters. This whole design process was really interesting. At this point, we didn't know if these were going to be accomplished with bodysuits or prosthetics or maybe even animatronic puppets, so everything was up for grabs. But the project fell through, and Studio ADI, Amalgamated Dynamics, didn't want to be part of the project when it was reborn because the project called for mostly CGI. You can watch that full video of Woodruff and Gillis by clicking on the link in the description below. 
Now, the reason I mention this, the reason I think it's worth mentioning, is because I Am Legend is one of those movies I would really argue would be a lot better without the CGI they used. Anyway, after feeling a bit burned by the thing, Woodruff and Gillis set off to make their own movie, Harbinger Down, which uses almost all practical effects. It's a somewhat tongue-in-cheek B-movie style horror, clearly with influences from The Thing, set on an Alaskan trawler. With crowdfunding giving the project almost $400,000 and additional funding from Dark Dunes Productions, it pains me to say they didn't really get the budget they needed to do what they wanted. The special effects are interesting, but they're not really present enough to be remarkable. Harbinger Down isn't really a good example of how The Thing 2011 could have looked because the productions were so different. The Thing had literally a hundred times the budget of Harbinger Down. I think the best indication of how The Thing might have looked with the practical effects they originally intended to use is probably the footage that Amalgamated Dynamic put out themselves, and maybe this from Harbinger Down. <laughs> So why didn't they use the practical effects as they were shot, or with just a little bit of digital enhancing, for The Thing? Well, perhaps our best piece of evidence is an interview the director, Mattis van Heiningen, did with Den of Geek in 2012, where he said, Although we shot the film practically, at the end of the day, it didn't hold up. It looked a bit like an 80s movie, actually, which for some people is really special, but perhaps not in 2010, 2011 so we enhanced it with CG. Now, it would be pretty easy to pour all of the blame on Heiningen, especially after saying that. And he is the director, he has to take some of the responsibility, I guess. But originally, he and the scriptwriter, Eric Heisserer, were very pro-practical effects. They were very pro-animatronic. Before the film came out, and I guess before they jellied it with CGI, they made a really big deal about it using practical effects. In Bloody Disgusting, in 2011, Heisserer said this, I got this job going in with the firm, fervid belief that no CGI should ever be in this movie. That it should be all practical. We are creating a very grounded psychological thriller. And part of that paranoia with the monster movie is to have the monsters as real and as grounded as everything else we're making around them. And I couldn't agree any more with that sentiment. That's my whole argument for why Bottin's effects are amazing. Tellingly, Heisserer also adds this. The thing that we have to remember is that it is first and foremost a studio property. There is a trend, and it's been a trend for a while, where young filmmakers get an opportunity to work on major studio films. The drawback is that they don't have nearly the authority of someone like Ridley Scott, and their vision going into the project may end up being very different from what the final cut is. He adds too that the film was greatly changed by test audiences. The pacing of The Thing 2011 was changed, as was the film's ending. The link to that interview is also in the description. It's quite long and there's a lot of information there, so check it out if you have the time. Now obviously this is just what Eric Heisserer says, but with the fact they very deliberately shot the movie with practical effects, I'm inclined to think replacing those effects with CG was a studio decision. It's certainly dumb enough to be a studio decision. CGI is usually about five times as expensive as top of the line animatronics, and it certainly didn't help the thing. The thing lost more than $10 million. It was a boneheaded decision, both artistically and in terms of business, by Universal to replace Amalgamated Dynamics' work. It may have been a decision based on test audiences, but clearly, it wasn't a decision that understood the established audience of the thing, that understood their wants, or understood their expectations. And I'd have said, going out on a limb here, the established audience of the thing, the audience who loved the 1982 The Thing, are going to be pretty important if you're going to call your movie The Thing. The movie's box office failure can't be attributed just to the effects, of course not. But if you go into a YouTube video which is clips from the prequel, all the comments say is how nuts they were to replace the practical effects with the CG they used. And what a wasted opportunity. This could have been the film that shone a spotlight on practical effects and made other studios and directors realize they don't have to make everything look like a video game. Well, it could be worse. They could take the 1982 film and digitally replace all the monsters. That doesn't exist, right? Well, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate you watching. It helps me a lot if you like and subscribe, because, like Universal, 
YouTube is a heartless numbers machine. Also, if you'd like to write a comment, I'd love to know what you think about CGI in live action films. Did it ever make a movie really good? Did it ever save a movie? See you next time.